Peter, chapter 3, we start with verse 8. Do not forget about this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it lay bare. Since, this is ha since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. It's speed, it's coming. The day will bring about the destruction of the fire, uh, destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth and the home of righteousness. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us. God, we just pray that as we study and examine your word today, that we understand its purpose and, it, and what it is trying to teach. So please give us strength, guidance, and direction to understand your word and to put your word into practice. Praise in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Peter here is talking about the return of Jesus Christ. And he is talking about it being soon. And talking about that it will come like a thief in the night. And as Peter is talking about this, as he's talking about the time of Jesus Christ drawing near, the Apostle Peter asks, what type of people will we be? See, I think this is a fundamental and important question as we longing for and waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. And in fact, when we take the Lord's Supper here for a little bit, that is a celebration of His death, burial, and resurrection and that we're looking forward to His return. As we are waiting, let's ask the question, what type of people ought we to be? This is an important and necessary question. In other, in other words, why would we delay with anything that we need to do if we know that the return of Jesus Christ is near? First of all, let's ask the question, what do we mean by His return is near? Look at Matthew chapter 24, starting with verse 36. Matthew chapter 24, starting with verse 36, looking through verse 44. In this passage he says, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days... Before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took, all, took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day the, your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. <coughs> what the scripture is saying is that God did not tell us when the return of Christ would happen. We are just told it will happen. Peter said, that to, according to the Lord, who is eternal. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. When you're an eternal God that have always existed and always will exist, time is not measured in the same way that we understand it. If I say in a little while the sermon will be done, you're thinking this is going to be a short five-minute sermon, right? No, to a preacher that means uh, probably about 40 minutes or so, right? Maybe an hour. That's soon, right? Somebody said right? Oh, come on. But anyways, the point is, time is relative to how we keep track of it. God says it's going to be soon, and according to the way God measures time, it is still coming soon. But no one knows when that day will be. You can study it all day, every day, for the rest of your life, and you're still not going to get it right. That's why when these guys write these books saying they know when the time of Christ is coming back, save yourself some money. Don't buy the book. They don't know. 
Jesus Christ said that. Now even if we did know, no one knows when he or she will die. Death is not convenient, and it strikes at some of the most inconvenient times. No one knows when their time is going to be in this world. So that's why you've got to be prepared, not only for the return of Jesus Christ, but only for your own time. You may have 10 minutes, you may have 10 years, you may have 100 years. You don't know. But Christ does. Christians are told to be prepared for that moment at any time. At any time. When you know something is going to happen, but you don't know when you are prepared for it. It's like most of you here. Thief doesn't call and tell you in advance when he or she is coming to rob your house, right? Do you not take steps prepared for just in case that event happens one night? You lock up your house. You have a security system. Maybe you have a dog. You have other things to prepare yourself in case a thief decides to jump at your house. That's the analogy that Jesus Christ has given. He's coming back. We just don't know when. Since we don't know when the return could happen, we are to be prepared at all times for it. That includes repentance. Look at Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Repentance is a very simple definition. You stop doing bad, you start doing good. You turn away from your sins. Look what, the, look what John said about this. John said to the crowd coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. If you do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For you, I, I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Repentance means turning away from our sins and changing to our righteous behavior. And John the Baptist here does an excellent job of going through and describing what it means to repent and how that works and how that should look like. And the Scripture calls us to truly repent. We cannot continue in our sin and be right with God. 1 John chapter 3 tells us that. If you look at 1 John chapter 3, it says that anyone who continues in sin is not in God. We have to at some point change our lives. The longer we hang on to our sin, the harder it will be to quit. You know that bad habit, not necessarily maybe a sin, but maybe that bad habit you had, and you say, one day I'll quit. One day turns into one week. One week turns into one month. One month turns into a year. Before you know it, you are spending almost half of a lifetime saying you're going to quit a habit. But the more you do that habit, the more you engage in it, the harder it is to quit. And when we're talking about sin, sin is a master. That's the way the Scriptures describe it. And it is an addiction for many people. And the more we feed our sin, the more it grows. The more you participate, the more it grows. And the more it grows, the harder it is to quit. At some point, we have to stop this is why we cannot wait to repent. We must do it now when conviction hits us. Scripture doesn't say, quit sinning in a week. Quit sinning in a month. When conviction <coughs> hits us, we need to make the determination at that point and at that time that is the Holy Spirit hitting our heart. That is the Word of God penetrating right to the bone for us to say it is time to quit that sin. It is time to turn our life around. The more we wait harder it is. Sin grows if we don't repent. Now part of repentance is to submit to Christian baptism. I want you to look at Acts chapter 8 30 through 38. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard that the man was reading Isaiah the prophet. 
Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the eunuch was reading this, message of script, this passage of Scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave the order to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. The New Testament practice was to baptize a sinner when he understood the gospel. Now that's key, understanding the gospel. Understanding the gospel means this. Do you understand what sin is? Disobedience to God. Do you understand that you have sinned? All people are sinners. Do you understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the only God, the creator of heaven and earth? Confess Him as your Lord and Savior. We submit to Christian baptism for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. When people understand that and they come to that understanding and they know that, somebody has sat down, has explained it to them, and they know that, then it is time for them to be baptized. If they don't understand the gospel, they can't comprehend it. Maybe they are too young. Maybe they just don't understand some of the things. You sit down and you explain the very basic to them. When they understand the very basic, <laughs> baptize them. Waiting to be baptized creates opportunities to create excuses. Excuses are Satan's best weapons. So you can bring a person to conviction. But the longer they wait, the easier it is to make excuses. You ever, you ever know that you needed to exercise? I mean, we all need to exercise. You ever told yourself, today is not a good day? If I start next week, next week I can plan out, I can get the exercise equipment up, I can you know, block off a period of time, I can start next week. Next week rolls around, you know, today's not a good day either. Today's not a good day because I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I'm tired, I don't have... I didn't get that exercise. You keep creating excuses. That's what waiting does. It's just like, you know, if you have a medical problem, you know that there's a medical problem, when do you want to take care of it? Immediately. Immediately. If you know, you'll come up with excuses of why you shouldn't go back to the doctor. And it's the same way in a Christian life. So here's the question. Why wait when we have the opportunity now? When the unit came to a body of water, he gave the order to stop. He says, look, there's water right here. Why can't we do this now? When you have the opportunity, you do it. You take it. You seize it. You don't wait. Because we don't know how many opportunities we truly have. You ever been on that road and you look down at your gas gauge and it says E. <laughs> and you think, and you see a gas station. Nah, I'll wait just a little bit longer. I can tell by some of the looks out here that some people have tried this before. And you didn't make it to the next gas station. That's why you don't wait. If you have the opportunity, you take it. Right then, right there. We don't always know how long we have to even share the gospel. We have to evangelize now. Look at Romans chapter 10, start with verse 8. Romans chapter 10, start with verse 8 through verse 15. But what does it say? The word is near you, is in your mouth and in your heart. That it is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For it is with your feet, or excuse me, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Only the church can evangelize the lost. I want, you to, I want you to remember this. I want you to think about this. I want this to dwell in your heart and in your mind and understand it. The government is not commissioned to teach your faith <coughs> to people. Charities are not called to proclaim your faith to people. Your neighbor is not called to do this. The church, every individual Christian is called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to people in this world. Those who do not accept the message will be lost. You know, we often quote John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son who ever believes in Him will not be condemned, or will not be, or He who believes in Him will be saved. Did you ever finish that chapter? You know what he says after that? Anybody who doesn't believe will be condemned. This is the second reality the church has to accept. Those who do not accept the message will be lost. That's hell. That's eternal fire. That's damnation. Not for a little while. For eternity. <clears throat> this is even true of those who have not heard the gospel. Your sin sends you to hell. If the church is silent, people go to hell. What would people think of you if there was a massive, if this building caught on fire massively and you saw it and you ran out the door without telling anybody, you didn't tell anybody, nobody else saw it, and that you knew that the fire is going to engulf all sides and you got out safely and you sat there and watched the, watched the church burn with people in it, what would they think of you? You may be going to heaven, but we can't watch the world be burned in hell. We have a job, we have a commission. And it is the job of every individual Christian to share that message. And I want to tell you, you never know when that last opportunity is to explain the gospel. The last time you see somebody may well be the last time you see someone. And there is an eternity in hell. You never know when that last opportunity is to preach that gospel. You never know that last opportunity to say, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about your sin. Let me tell you what the scripture says. You never know when that is. Why wait when the opportunity is here, when the opportunity is now? You say, I'm not good at sharing the gospel. Can't you just talk? I'm not trying to be sarcastic, and I'm not trying to belittle evangelism, but evangelism ultimately is just talking. You realize that? You ever had a conversation where you tried to co convince somebody to vote for someone? You ever had a conversation of trying to convince somebody to go to a movie? You ever had the conversation of trying to convince someone to date you? Or to marry you? You ever had the conversation of why your team is better than the rest? If you can do that in all these other areas, you can do that with the gospel because the gospel is ultimately sitting down and talking to people about faith in Jesus Christ. <coughs> why are you a Christian? That's all you got to explain. Somebody says, why are you a Christian? I'm a Christian because I don't want to go to hell. What do you mean? 
well, my sin sends me to hell. My Savior died for my sins, and I can go to heaven, and I can explain to you just exactly how I had, how I was saved. Just the same way you got me saved. You can talk about your job. You can talk about sports. You can talk about politics. You can talk about news. You can convince somebody to go hang out with you. Then you can convince somebody about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not as hard as you think. And I wouldn't even say, not only just this, but I think we need to reconcile with people while we can. I want us to read something that Jesus Christ said. Matthew chapter 5, 21 through 26. But you have heard that it was said that the people long ago do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother Raka is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in the danger of fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. <coughs> First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and then you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Scripture makes a point that it's just as important to forgive as it is to receive forgiveness. In fact, if you will not forgive, you will not be forgiven. That's what Jesus said. It's his very words. You don't want to suffer just because of a hardened heart. You want to forgive just as you've been forgiven by God. And face folks, let's face facts. We live in a world of problems. And it sometimes creates problems with one another with another person. I like to say this. We are imperfect people living in an imperfect world with imperfect situations. If you're waiting for perfection, that's in heaven. I will even say this. The church is full of imperfect people. All of us who are gathered here today are not perfect. If you think you're perfect, I hate to tell you, you entered into the wrong place. Only Jesus Christ is perfect. And His perfection is what has purchased our forgiveness of sins. If you were so perfect, you wouldn't need Jesus Christ. By being here today, you are admitting your imperfection. And we live with a world of imperfect people. And sometimes we create situations that are not perfect. As far as it is possible, we need to reconcile with those we are separated from. Now put as far as possible, sometimes reconciliation isn't possible because some person may not want it. Some person may say, I don't want to reconcile with you, and then it, that, that's beyond your control. You can't force somebody to like you. You can't force somebody to get along with you. God does not even force people to choose Him. But, if you have the ability to reconcile, then you need to try the best of your ability. It's hard, but it is necessary. Once again, you never know when that last time is the last time. And when that person is gone, you will have to live with that hurt for the rest of your life knowing that you never could reconcile with that person. As we look in the Scripture today, we have discovered that Jesus Christ said He's returning soon, but none of us know when that is. And as we've seen that, we know that we need to get our lives right by quitting our sin and committing our lives to Jesus in the act of Christian baptism. We know that we have a responsibility to other people to share the gospel with them, and as far as it is with us, to reconcile with them. So here's the question we're going to finish the sermon on. It's a simple question that maybe has a hard answer. What are you waiting on? Simple question. 
If you know what you're supposed to do, either with your life or with someone else's life, what are you waiting on? What holds you back? You can think of excuses. You can give excuses. But excuses never change a situation. What are you waiting for? Every Sunday we offer an opportunity for an invitation. The invitation is an opportunity for you to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, repent of your sins, be baptized for forgiveness of your sins. It might be a time for you to reconcile with God to repent of your sins. It might just be a time to ask for prayer from the church. As we go to our moment of invitation, I want that question to ring in your head. What are you waiting for? Let's stand as we sing our invitation song. <laughs>